everybody, Dr. Joe here, and I uh, hope everyone's doing well on this Wealth Wednesday. Uh, it's getting cold, getting cold, so it looks like winter is approaching. Well, I hope you hopefully you had a, a great Thanksgiving. Uh, I had to do a uh, recorded session last week. I went to a, um, a holiday party, so kudos to Ryan and the folks down uh, at Keller Williams for inviting me to their uh, event down at Capitol Hill. We had a great time. Good stuff. Anyway, today we're going to talk about the, the subject is called preparing, uh, preparing your uh, preparing for the refinance, what you should do and when you should do it. OK, so preparing for refinance, what you should do and when you should do it. The reason why I, I chose this topic is because, um, you know, as, as we all know, the market is kind of slowing. And, and from my perspective, it's a great time to consider buying. Uh, there's less competition. Uh, sellers are a lot more reasonable compared to maybe six months ago. And there are fewer investors and homeowners who are in the market. So if they have to sell, sellers tend to be a bit more flexible. And, uh, you know, and having gone through this market several times, I realized that if we can hold on to these assets until the market comes back, which may be, you know, several months, even several years from now, uh, the you know the market generally is going to come back. Um, it just don't know when. So if you can buy it now, hold it, and then maybe cash out in the future when the market comes back, um, it's a good thing. So um, you know, so one way to get money is to extract equity from a house. So you're going to have to do a refinance, and uh, and so I thought it'd be a good time to talk about that because a lot of people. Are, uh, have equity in their homes uh, since the market has been pretty good for the last uh, few years. And uh, if they want to take advantage uh, of, uh, of the market, the slow market, uh, then they need to be able to pull some cash from somewhere. And uh, if you have a property, whether it be a primary residence or an investment property, uh, it's a good way to tap into that uh, through uh, some kind of either cash out, refinance, or, or some other method. And uh, obviously, if we do the Burr strategy, then one of the key aspects of the Burr, uh, that's the third R, that's the buy, rent, buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. So the third R is the refinance. So uh, so let's talk about that <clears throat> and, uh, and so on. So uh, I'm going to be probably refinancing maybe one or two of my rental properties, uh, be able to tap into some of that uh, equity that I have. And then leverage that to acquire more properties. Uh, I will be buying some more, and um, yeah. So uh, looking forward to the the market slowdown and uh, and so on. Okay, so let's talk about this. So one of the best ways to build your rental portfolio is through the Burr strategy, and uh, that's the buy, renovate, rent, and refinance and repeat. And uh, you know, but obviously to do this, you need money. You need a source of capital for, to fund the the purchase and the renovations, you also need a reliable contractor uh, to, you know, to actually implement the renovation. And then you'll need some kind of banking relationship uh, to take out the financing at the back end. So uh, these are the key things uh, as part of the Burr. But the refinance stage uh, is the key. It's the maker or the breaker of this whole thing. And uh, the key to that is to get the right valuation uh, at the end of the day, you know, so you can recoup your capital and then that will take you to the last or the fourth, uh, the fourth, yeah, the fourth R, which is to repeat. Okay, so that's um, so without a good value on your refinance, you know, you may be left with some money uh, in the property, which is okay. Um, but you know, at some point, if you keep on leaving too much money in that asset, you're going to run out of money. So you need to be able to try to extract or pull out as much money as you can. And otherwise, it becomes unsustainable. You're going to run out of money and therefore won't be able to do too many of these uh, Burr projects. So, uh, you know, so that's the reason why, uh, you know, the refinance is so key. So what we're going to talk about today is a step-by-step -step guide to getting your Burr property across what I call the finish line. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. So get your questions together. And uh, we're going to have a, a live Q&A this week. And uh, I'd be more than happy to answer all the questions, whether it be real estate related to the what and uh, and so on. So, uh, OK, so let's talk about uh, preparing for the refinance, what you should do 
you know, and uh, and when you should do it. So step one is uh, you obviously got to find a lender. And uh, I put there in brackets and cast a wide net. Um, you know, there are lenders and there are lenders. Not all lenders are the same. Uh, I've learned that the hard way. You get some of them are really, really good to work with and some of them which are a nightmare to work with. Um, you know, uh, you know, I'm not obviously not going to make, make any name, any names, but I've just had more success with smaller institutions as opposed to the larger big box, uh, more mega, uh, banks. Um, uh, again, nothing wrong with the mega banks and so on. But I just had more success with smaller local banks, uh, primarily because uh, <clears throat> local banks, decisions are usually made locally, and therefore you can establish relationships with people uh, at the local level. They, you can, you know, they can get to understand you, you can get to understand what their requirements are, and you can kind of get uh, <clears throat> you know, some kind of uh, understanding of uh, of the rules of how the game is played so that's just me i, I think when i first started I, I you know i was just looking anywhere whoever gives me money fine and that's still the case but uh you know the bigger banks decisions usually aren't made locally and uh and the people at the local branches let's say for the big box stores they usually just all they do is collect paperwork uh, and then it gets passed off and to corporate where you know where the decisions are made there and there's very little flexibility it has to fit in a certain box if it doesn't fit uh, all the check boxes then the loan is uh, kind of denied and um, there's really little very little wiggle room so uh so look for a lender is really big it's important and cast a wide net you know, one of the mistakes that uh, I used to do, and I think a lot of people do, is just pick one lender and put all their eggs in one basket, which is not a good idea. It's never a good idea to put your eggs in any one basket. So start looking around. Uh, how do you uh, – don't make that error of putting all your eggs and all your hopes in one basket. Uh, but start looking and start vetting and building rapport with lenders as soon as possible in the process. Uh, you know, just because you meet somebody today doesn't mean they're going to give you the money today. It takes time. It takes uh, relationship building. It takes a whole bunch of different things, which I'm going to talk about today. But you want to start the process as soon as you can, you know, when you realize you're going to need some money. And, uh, you know, obviously, if you have a private money or hard money or, or you borrowed money as part of the renovation, um, you know, and you're holding on to this asset, you know, you got costs. And so you don't want to be start scurrying around looking for lenders at the back end of your Burr project. You want to be able to, as soon as you finish the rehab and you find a tenant, it's go straight into the refi. And that is too late to start looking for a, a financial institution at the end. You know, you want to start early in the process. And, um, you know, because uh, they will, you know, yeah. So, you know, be <clears throat> proactive in that. And the best way to um, then the question be you probably may ask is, well, Dr. Joe, well, I don't know any banks. Uh, I don't know anybody who can, you know, do this for me. Uh, well, that's OK. Uh, I didn't when I first started. So what do you do? You ask for referrals. You uh, discuss with other um, other investors and see what banks they're using. And uh, hopefully they'll recommend and refer. I'm always referring the institutions I use to people, to trusted uh, investors. Uh, I don't have a problem uh, with that. And uh, so you can go to uh, other investors who, um, you know, doing the similar kind of things you are. You can go to RIA, meeting, RIA meetings, real estate, in, real estate investor association meetings, meet, meet <laughs> real estate investor RIA meetings. And speak to other uh, investors, find out from them. Usually a lot of these uh, rear meetings, there's probably somebody down there who's uh, a money lender. So, uh, you know, they, you should be able to get some referrals that way. And also, obviously, you can just randomly call uh, banks or financial institution and essentially say, hey, I'm a real estate investor. I've got a deal I'm working on and I'm looking to refinance uh, this single family or this multifamily building. And, uh, you know, do you refinance? Uh, 
or can you refinance it for me? Um, yeah, you know, I'm not a great fan of that that strategy where I sort of pick up the phone and call somebody. Uh, and uh, because you're, you're probably going to speak to a customer service person and they may or may not know what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, so that, yeah, but you can call around. And uh, but also a thing that you need to remember is that some of these banks have what we call seasoning requirements, uh, seasoning requirements. That is um, what I mean by seasoning is that uh, if you do a deal, buy a house and you renovate the house, there's a period of time before you can refinance or get a new loan on that property. The loan, uh, you have to be a seasoned, you have to own that asset for uh, a, you know, a decent amount of time. And that's what we call seasoning. Now, different banks have different seasoning requirements. Some banks uh, have three months. you got to own it for three months before you can refinance. Some of it is six months. Some of it is 12 months uh, and so on. So different banks have different requirements as it pertains to season. So you want to find that out because you may not, if you chose that bank and they have, let's say, a 12-month seasoning requirement, you may not be, well, you will not be able to uh, refinance that until 12 months or 306 until day 366 um, because they won't allow you to uh, refinance within the 12 month period of time. So you want to know that. And I learned that the hard way also where I sort of, uh, I didn't know that uh, with this particular bank and uh, all gung ho to do a deal. And then towards the end, they told me they couldn't do it because uh, I hadn't owned the house long enough. I hadn't, I wasn't seasoned, uh, you know, so obviously, you know, that will, that will, you know, and you've got holding costs, um, you know, you've got uh, carrying costs and uh, now you have to start all over again. So, you know, take the time, listen to, uh, check out referrals, speak to other people early in the process. So that way you can start getting your, um, the, you know, the documents together and so on. So that's step one which is look for a lender and cast a wide net. So now that we found a lender, next thing we want to do is step two, which I call uh, build a rapport with a lender. Okay. Uh, build a rapport with a lender. Why? Because people like to do business with people who they like, know, and trust. And, uh, and that's how rapport building comes in, into play. Um, you know, it's, you, you know, not everybody, uh, you know, is good at rapport or, or networking or, or, or relationship building. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. And, uh, if you're not comfortable in a, in a sort of a, 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 a large environment, like a RIA, maybe invite them for a cup of coffee, lunch, uh, whereby you can sort of get to know that person and they can get to know you. And, uh, you know, so schedule some time, get to know them because, you know, once you get to know them and they get to know you, hopefully they could be your advocate. OK, they could be the one uh, providing you with some, quote unquote, insider information about the bank, their process, how decisions are made, uh, what they look for, what they don't look for, who the key players are, uh, how long's the timeline uh you know, do's and don'ts or i mean all those things you can get from this uh trusted person once they feel comfortable with you all this insider uh info and also you can take the time for them to explain to them why they should do want to do business with you um you know you want to talk about your business uh you can talk about what your experience is like uh maybe your criteria your processes your systems uh, your network, your relationship, you can talk about that and explain to them and convince them and share with them why they should do business with you. They want to lend money, but they're not just going to lend the money to any Tom, Dick and Harry uh, and vice versa. You don't want to borrow money from any Tom, Dick and Harry. You want to make sure that whoever you're borrowing money from is the right fit. But the thing is that it's, it's really important, especially that's why I like small banks is because you can start developing these relationships um you know which you may not uh, with and the, and the um the decision makers there aren't too many layers uh within the organization it's not a, a high a hierarchical hier hierarchical you know what i'm saying Hier hierarchical oh anyway you get what i'm saying 
there's not a lot of layers between them and the decision makers um you know and therefore they they will know the decision makers and therefore hopefully will be the advocate for you and uh and sometimes if there's a gray area this is something really important if there's a gray area that your advocate can be the one to push your uh application along such that it does get approved so uh you know look out for these advocates look out for, develop these relationships and and that's really been one of the keys to my success is you can't really do uh, real estate without financing. You really can't. And uh, and therefore, I've taken the time to uh, develop these relationships, strategic relationships with uh, various financial institutions and various people within these financial institutions uh, such that when I need money, uh, they know me, I know them, and uh, they know what I'm looking for, and I know what they're looking for, and we can be able to get the job done without a whole lot of drama. So build rapport with a lender um, because the bottom line is that people like to do business with people they like. And uh, you want to make sure that uh, you are, quote, unquote, liked by them. So that's step two. And, uh, again, you know, if you've got some questions, uh, put them in the uh, comment box. And uh, I'll be in the chat box, and I'll be able to answer those questions a bit later on in the program. And uh, and so on. So put your questions together and uh, looking forward to, uh, you know, discussing or answering some of those questions for you later on. So, OK, so let's keep on going to step three uh, of the process. And uh, and that is, um, you know, get your financial house in order. OK, uh, you really do. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to to approach a lender. And you haven't got your financial documents, so you haven't got your financial records organized in place and ready to roll. Um, you know, it 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 doesn't do you any good, um, and it certainly doesn't make you look uh, professional. Uh, you you know, they're going to ask, well, there's certain documents we're going to need, and you have you're clueless as to what they need, and you're clueless how to get it. Because you haven't taken the time to assemble all the documents that you know these documents uh, these lenders are going to be looking for, so it also it it it, it makes you look amateurish, uh, I think anyway. And uh, what I do, uh, I put all my documents. Um, uh, it depends. Sometimes in a binder. Uh, well, the old days I used to put it in a binder. You know all the documents that I know that the uh, typical bankers will look for things like. Uh, what they call personal financial statements, um, you know, tax returns, uh, bank account statements, you know, any assets that you own, any liability statements that you have. I mean, these are things that typically uh, banks are looking for. So I would assemble those and organize them in a binder and the three ring binder, nice cover. And, uh, and therefore, when I meet with a prospective lender, I just kind of quickly review uh, my documents so they can see straight away that ah, this guy's serious he's got his act together and so on um another way is to put all that documents obviously electronically um you know so now i also do that in in um google so uh, no google, dropbox so we have a dropbox file uh folder where all these documents are are, are stored and therefore they can be uh you know uh accessed at very very short notice uh, if you have, uh, uh, if you're a real, a real estate investor uh, and a landlord, there's a pretty good chance you're using some kind of software uh, to run your business. Or I hope you're using some kind of software uh, to run your business. Uh, I use uh, QuickBooks, and that's the software that uh, my accountant uh, requires that I use, which is what I do. I run all my businesses, run everything through that. Also, you can run, uh, your, if you're a landlord, through some of these property management software like Buildium, uh, Appfolio, Rent Ready. There's a whole host, you know, there's a whole host of those different products out there. But the good thing about those software is that it helps you stay organized. It helps you to develop reports. It helps you to um, to know how you're doing uh, from uh, from a business standpoint. So it's really really good to do that. You know, get your financials together. 
uh, if a, you know, uh, the idea is that if a lender looks at your financials, um, they can make a pretty good assessment uh, on whether uh, you're a go or no go. You know, and it's really not up to them to figure it all out. You don't want to just give them a, a whole bunch of stuff and let them try and de sort of de decipher it. Uh, it needs to be clearly organized such that they can sort of, uh, you know, uh, review it and then make a decision, hopefully a positive decision uh, and so on. Because as I said, a confused mind always tends to say no. And uh, you don't want to confuse people with uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, stuff which is hard to decipher. Uh, so that is step three. So, you know, let's just quickly run through steps one, two, and three. Uh, so step one is look for a lender. We talk about refinancing. Uh, look for a lender and cast a wide net. Uh, step two is, uh, you know, once you've done that, you want to start building a rapport with the lender. Uh, I wouldn't suggest you just do one. Maybe have two or three lenders that you're working with. Uh, build that rapport, take them for lunch, uh, get to know their business, what they're looking for, uh, explain to them what you're doing on your business and what you're looking for, and hopefully there's a meeting in the minds, and, uh, and therefore you generate what we call an advocate. And this advocate is going to be your gatekeeper. He's the one or she's going to be the one to push your uh, loans, uh, applications, and um, you know, through the system and through the organization, hopefully get some real positive uh, outcomes. That's step two. And step three is uh, get your financial ones. <clears throat> you know, you want to get your financial house in order, get all your documents together. And, uh, you know, I'll talk about some of those documents a bit later on. Uh, but you want to get all your stuff together. Obviously, most banks are going to look for a credit score. So you want to know what your credit score is. They're going to look for bank statements. They're going to look for tax returns. They're going to look for personal financial statements. They're going to look for a whole bunch of different documents. And you, you know, maybe one, two, or three years worth of tax returns, uh, bank statements, and so forth. Uh, you know, two or three months of bank statements and so on. So there's a bunch of documents that they need. And it's up to you now to assemble them. That's step three. And then we're going to step four, which is uh, make your property shine. Okay. At some point, you're going to do a refinance. Okay. And uh, there's going to be an appraisal. Uh, typically that's going to take place. So an appraiser is going to come to your home and to gauge how much the value of your home is. Okay, so uh, one of the things you want to do is, uh, you know, when they come there, you want your house to be presentable. Um, you know, you don't want to come across as a slumlord. You don't want to come across as, a, you know, as, a, as an amateur. Uh, you know, if it's uh, a new rehab, then, you know, it's not a good idea to over rehab the house, but uh, you want to make it presentable. If there are tenants in there, uh, you want to make sure that the tenants are aware uh, that uh, what you're trying to do. And hopefully they're on board and they're going to you know, make sure the house is presentable uh, on the day of the refund, on the day the appraiser comes out. If, if you have to incentivize uh, the tenant, then so be it. You know, give them a couple of dollars to uh, you know get the place straightened out and say you know say the nice nice words and things like that. Uh, but you want to make sure that the house is you, you're presenting your best, you're putting your best foot forward uh, when the appraiser comes out. So make your property shine. This is really really important uh, because the 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 appraiser doesn't know uh, you know uh, what you've done to the home. <clears throat> They don't know the background. All they can see is what's in front of their eyes. And so you want to make sure that that message, whatever it is, is a positive message and it's going to reflect well on you. So make your property shine. And uh, on first, uh, you know, because first impression, as they say, are lasting impressions. And then go to step five, which is, you know, document your, sub you know, submit your documents. Okay. Again, you know, th there's a pretty good chance the lender is going to tell you, hey, uh, Dr. Joe or, 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 or lender, we're going to need documents A, B, C, D, E, F, G uh, from you. As I talked about earlier on, uh, I put my stuff in binders and have it already organized. So it's easy for me to pull that stuff together. Um, again, it just it's all part of that sort of branding as, as, as a professional, someone who knows what they're doing somebody who's, uh, you know, a good risk and somebody who's uh, very, you know, got their act together. 
And, uh, you know, because this is really important for the advocate uh, because they're trying to hopefully help you and you want to make their job as easy as possible uh, so that they can help you. OK, so what are the, uh, the type of documents that uh, banks and financial institutions usually want from you? Uh, personal financial statement is one. A uh, personal financial statement is like a, a, a summary of your assets, your liabilities, and it tends to um, determine or in there is your what we call the net worth, financial net worth. So they want to list all your assets, all the things that you own. Uh, it could be homes, vehicles, uh, personal property, uh, bank accounts, uh, you know, 401k statements, uh, investment accounts, all these are all assets. Okay. And then you want to include in there your liabilities, all the loans and, you know, and uh, that you have, whether it be credit cards or whether it be mortgages, whether it be personal loans, uh, these are liabilities. These are things that you owe other people. The difference between the assets minus liability after all is said and done is your financial net worth. Um, that is the baseline measurement that um, that most financial institutions, in fact, most investors. Well, I do. I think it's really important to 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 know what your financial net worth is. Uh, it's painful uh, going through this exercise where you list all your assets and liabilities, but also it's very helpful. Um, you know, I really got into this when I read that book. Um, the Millionaire Real Estate Investor by Gary Keller. Um, you know, he, it, it kind of educates me on, on the importance of understanding what your financial net worth is. Uh, and they gave you like a little spreadsheets and uh, whereby you can determine that. And it's a painful exercise. Um, you know, it's a day of reckoning. Uh, and what he advised, what I was advised to do was to put your personal possessions at zero. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, your, 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 you know, your clothes, your uh, furniture and all that, put it at zero. Okay. Cause a lot of people tend to inflate that, um, you know, but, you know, but you want to list your assets. What do you actually own? Uh, real estate, stocks, investments, 401ks, SEP accounts, um, you know, bank accounts, uh, these are your assets. And he tends to want to limit your vehicles, all things that kind of depreciate in value, whether it be your personal possessions, vehicles, and things like that. Uh, and then your liabilities, what do you owe? You know, loans, credit cards, uh, mortgages, uh, debts to other people, put that down. And uh, what, what, what that does, what that did for me, uh, it said to me, anyway, when I first did this many, many years ago, was, wow, this is not looking good. <laughs> okay. And what do I need to do to increase this? Okay. And Gary Keller recommends that you do this every three months, this exercise. Um, you know, and so I was doing that on a regular basis. What do I need to do to increase my financial net worth? And the biggest thing for me was to acquire assets, acquire property, and uh, not just any properties, but properties that uh, have uh, equity in there, because that's, you know, when you subtract the value from the liability, the mortgage, you're going to have equity, which is going to build your financial, um, you know, net worth. So I was just looking at that, and it's, you know, over, over a period of time, I got really, really focused and fixated on what I need to do to increase that financial net worth. And uh, so go through that exercise if you can. Um, as I said, there's a book, Billionaire Real Estate Investor by Gary Keller, where he kind of talks about this in, in more detail. But anyway, so personal financial statements is probably what the bank's going to look for. They're going to probably want your tax returns, uh, maybe two or three years worth of tax returns, uh, either personal tax returns and, uh, and many times business tax returns. Uh, the property that you intend to refinance, they want some financials about that. Uh, market value, estimated market value, condition of the property, and all those kind of different things. Uh, probably some idea of what we call the rent rolls, uh, which is uh, how much does this thing rent for? Uh, market and what can you expect 
uh, I know for me, when I do the, uh, when I rent to Section 8, I go to the Housing Authority's website and I can pull down from the website, okay, this house has four bedrooms, it's in this neighborhood, therefore I know I can get this rent, okay? So that's what I can put, uh, you know, get that from the public records. But the, the appraiser probably wants an idea of what the rent rolls are. And I like to provide, um, you know, this to the uh, appraiser such that they don't sort of uh, lowball me, okay? And, uh, a you know, you want to include pictures of the property, um, you know, photographs. Of, if you have photographs before and after, that will be great. Uh, they probably want to include in there uh, something about a bio review your background, your real estate uh, experience. And uh, if you have it, maybe including there your business plan, what you intend to do uh, for this house and also as part of, as you grow, uh, grow your portfolio. So I put all this stuff in a Dropbox or I print it out into a folder and then I hand it over to the bank, um, you know, as part of that uh, loan submission. So these are the typical documents that banks look for, personal financial statements, uh, which has the listing of your assets and liabilities, uh, tax returns, uh, maybe two or three years of personal and business tax returns. They're probably going to need property information, uh, you know, especially if you're going to refinance a particular an, an investment property. They want some information about that. Uh, rent rolls, uh, rents that you can expect, uh, pictures of the property before and after, and uh, maybe a bio uh, about you, your real estate experience, and what you bring to the table, and uh, and so on. So try and assemble that beforehand. They're going to need it. So it's in your interest to have it ready. Okay, you don't want to be scurrying around for it uh, after you've established your uh, you know a relationship. You want to have it ready so you can hand it to them ASAP, so they can get on with the loan uh, process. Most banks are going to need this, so it's in your interest to actually go out and do it. So that's the five steps, um, you know, in terms of uh, getting ready for the refi. Okay, so again, the the you know, so the idea was that we are talking about preparing for the refinance, what you should do, and when you should do it. So I broke it into five steps. Step one: look for a lender. And cast a wide net. Step two, build rapport uh, with a lender. Good because why? Because people like to do business with people who they like, know, and trust. Step three. Uh, step three, sorry. Get your financial house in order. Uh, get all your documents together. Uh, start assembling them. And uh, I gave you a little list uh, a couple of minutes ago of what typically banks need uh, are looking for. So now is the time to start assembling it. Be proactive. Don't be scurrying around at the last minute trying to pull this stuff together. You want to have it ready, nicely, professionally bound in the binder or available uh, electronically, either through Google Drive or Dropbox or, or something like that. Step four is uh, make your property shine. The appraiser is going to come out. And when the appraiser comes out, you want your property to have its best foot forward. And uh, if it's a... Uh, uh, you know, a, a burr or just recently rehabbed. You want to have photographs in there and uh, before and after. You want a summary of what you improvements you did. Uh, if it's a rental, you want to make sure you get buying from the tenant such that uh, when the appraiser goes there, the, uh, you know, the tenant is going to be supportive and cooperative with the appraiser and not sort of uh, trashing you or trashing, you know, the property. Uh, and, and so on. And then step five is uh, document. Uh, once you know what documents need to be submitted, you submit. And as I said, uh, typically you want personal financial statements, tax returns, business and personal, uh, property financials, rent rolls, uh, condition of the property before and after photographs, uh, maybe a bio of yourself, and uh, possibly uh, if you have a resume, a real estate resume, that'll be good and have that available on a binder or in a Dropbox folder or at least a, uh, an electronic folder, which is accessible easily. So that's uh, sort of the thing. Uh, I thought I'd give you a little bonus. And so anyway, but enter your questions now. We're going to start the Q&A session very, very shortly. So uh, please put your questions in, and I'll be more than happy trying to answer those. 
Uh, so I'm going to go back to this. Is uh, So bonus. I'm going to give you a little bonus. Uh, tips for successful refinance. How about that? Um, if it's a commercial, uh, then you want to do the what we call the income um, you know, income approach. Uh, many times uh, when we do appraisals, they use the comparative approach, which is the comps, uh, in order to determine value. There's another method which they call the income approach, um, you know, whereby they do a calculation which will ultimately determine, um, you know, the cap rates and what we call the NOI, which is the net operating income. Uh, that's mainly for commercial properties, uh, sort of five units plus. Uh, I may primarily deal with the single family arena. So I'm usually, my appraisers tend to focus more on ca uh, comps as opposed to using the income approach. But if you are going to a commercial or multifamily, then uh, you know, make sure you use the commercial or the uh, income approach to determine what the value is and uh and so on okay that's one tip uh, number two is uh break out your construction costs uh this is really useful for the lender and also useful for the appraiser if you can sort of break it down uh into major line items carpentry plumbing roughing um you know, permits architect drawings uh electrical plumbing you know all that stuff you kind of break out the uh the um what's it called, the construction cost into logical line items. And uh, and therefore, when you give that to the appraiser or give that to the lender, they have a pretty good idea if, as to what you have done and how much did it cost. Um, it's important because it allows you to recoup those costs and you have some supportive documentation to prove your point. Okay, so break down your, um, you know, your your construction costs. Uh, a GC can be able to do that for you. If you are tracking your costs, then you should be able to do that yourself. Um, you know, it's it's good to do. I do that on all my projects. Is to track how much I'm spending and what buckets do those expenses go fall under. Uh, you know, some people, uh, some investors use what we call, you know, they, they have a line on construction management where they pay themselves uh, a management fee. That's also a line item on the, um, on the uh, construction cost uh, schedule and, uh, and so on. And then a third bonus tip is uh, make sure that you attend the appraisal. Uh, I'm not a great fan of uh, crossing my fingers and hope for the best. I like to attend the appraisers, appraisals, uh, because uh, you know I want to let the appraiser know that uh, you know who I am. I provide this documentation, supporting documentation, and hopefully build rapport with the uh, the appraiser such that uh, they're fair. Uh, I don't like to just cross my fingers and hopefully uh, and hope that the appraiser is going to be nice. Uh, I've tried that before; it doesn't always work. And uh, so I want to stack the deck in my favor uh, when I'm working with appraisers. And then that's it. That's it for today. Hopefully today was good. Uh, I'm going to go to some Q&As in a second. But that's the focus of today was sort of uh, we talked about, you know, preparing for the refinance, what you should do and when you should do it. So go, let's put some, let's go to Q&A. So we're going to the Ask Dr. Joe's part of this uh, program. So enter your questions in the chat box. And I will try to answer them for you. I know we always run out of time. So uh, let's put the questions in and let's see what happens. Okay. Uh, Johnny H. Hey, Johnny. How you going, man? Uh, I think my wife said that you had your, I think you had your, did you have your inspection today? Uh, anyway, if you did, let me know how it went. Um, I hope everything's going well on your project. So anyway, when assembling your net worth statement for lenders, this is from uh, Johnny. Okay. When assembling your net worth statements for lenders, do you estimate the equity in the house without an appraiser using comp search? Okay. So when assembling your net worth statement, which is sometimes called the personal financial statement for lenders, do you estimate the equity in the house without an appraiser using comp? Yes. So uh, as part of the... Um, uh, when you're putting together your net worth statement or personal financial statement, you're going to list all your assets. 
And uh, the biggest assets, obviously, are your um, real estate assets. And uh, But you don't know or you may not know what the value is as of today. Uh, you may have an idea. Uh, you know, you're not going to – I don't think it's, it's not really um, – if, if efficient or cost worthy, it's it's not. It doesn't make any sense to hire an appraiser to go give you the value of each your property that you have, especially if you have a lot of them. Uh, so you're going to have to kind of do a, a a best guess as to what you think the values are, or you can, as you say here, you can have um, uh, an appraiser. Uh, what's it called? Uh, a real estate agent. Uh, maybe they can provide you with some comps uh, of your property. So you can use those numbers in your net worth uh, or personal financial statement. So that's what I do. Uh, I don't hire an appraiser every time I'm updating my personal financial statement. I kind of, uh, you know, I've got a, a, I kind of got an idea of what houses are going for uh, in the area. And I use those. If necessary, I will contact a, um, um, a real estate agent and they will give me some comps as well. So, uh, so that's that one. So hopefully that was helpful. Uh, yeah, so I don't really use an appraiser uh, on each one. I just use the comps from a, a real estate agent. B. Francis, my rehab. So again, put your questions in the, in the uh, chat box and I'll try to answer them. Uh, good question so far. My rehab will be finished in a month. Will the bank assess the property? before it is completed. Okay, um, this is from B friends. My prop my rehab will be finished in a month. Okay, got it. Will the bank assess the property before it is completed? It depends um, uh, on where you are on this. So it depends on the type of loan that you have. If you have a construction loan, then typically um, the banker will, will do some kind of, they'll send an inspector to come out and, uh, you know, based on the, the completion, percentage completion, they will then allow a draw uh, to be taken place, i.e. they release the funds for the project. Now, that's it. That's during the construction. Now, in terms of the appraisal or the refi, typically what you do is you're going to, like you said, your, your project is going to be finished in a month. So what I would do if I have a project in a month that's come from completion, I will start the process now for the refinance, okay? I will contact the bank, let them know that we're almost done, let them know that, uh, what's it called, we're almost finished, and, um, you know, and what documents would they need from me to support the refinance? And they may say, okay, good. I'm glad that the project's going on well. We're going to need documents A, B, C, D, E, F, G, okay, uh, from 2021, 2020, 2019, tax returns, blah, blah, blah. They're going to give you a list of documents that they or information that they're going to need. So, uh, so again, the, the rehab is still going on, and I'm using that time to start assembling the information. There's no need at this point for an appraisal to take place uh, because the house is not yet finished. So uh, what I do is, and again, everyone's different. What I do is once the rehab is done, then uh, I would then, uh, what's it called? You can then, if you want to, you can then start the, you know, uh, scheduling for an appraiser. However, this is really important. You don't have a tenant yet, okay? And you won't be able to complete the refinance process until the tenant's in place because you have to show there's income from your property. So this is where it gets a little trickier. Uh, you start assembling the information. You can start your loan application. Uh, you can sort of schedule a, an appraiser once the project is finished, and you may or may not have a tenant. Uh, but what I try and do is to kind of, uh, you know, once the project is done, I move immediately to finding a tenant uh, so I start marketing the property. Uh, we stage it, uh, advertise, sh do some showings, and uh, and hopefully while that's going on, we'll be able to secure a tenant. Once we have a secure the tenant, if it's Section Eight, there's a whole bunch of different processes that goes on there uh, with the housing authority to get their buy-in and also get the scheduled inspection. So while that's going on, 
I'm still applying for the loan. The, the refinance will not take place until I have a lease. So, and I can show in black and white that I have this amount of income from the property. Because if I don't have a lease, then uh, they're going to say, well, you have this mortgage that you're trying to get, but there's no income. So you're going to have to qualify based on whatever your income you have. If you have a lease, then hopefully the income you're going to get from your property, from your rent, is going to offset the mortgage. So you don't have any negative cash flow. You have positive cash flow. Anyway, so uh, we, we make application and we show the house and then we try to coincide the... Um, the refinance, the actual completion of the refinance uh, after the tenant's in. So that's what I do. So uh, so they typically, you don't want them to do an assessment or an appraisal until the rehab is done. So in your case, uh, B. Francis, uh, you don't want the appraiser to come in there until at least a month from now when your project is completed. Okay, good questions. If you've got some questions again, put them in the, in the chat box. I'll be more than happy to try to get to them. Uh, let's have the next question. From Tammy T. Uh, Tammy T. Hi, Tammy. Uh, after buying a multifamily, we went from W-2 to independent contractor. Can this hurt, hurt us to refinance? Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. Let's have a look. Okay. So after, so Tammy's saying after buying a multifamily building, she bought a multifamily building and where she was working as a regular job, which is fine. And after she purchased that, uh, you know, that asset, that multifamily, she went to become a self-employed or independent contractor, maybe with a 1099. Uh, that may hurt you. It, may, it depends on the lender that you go through and the type of loan that you're getting. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, you know, as we all know, banks, they like uh, to show that you can pay the loan, which makes sense. And uh, the best way they can best way to prove that is to demonstrate um, reliable income. And your W-2 provided that. Uh, but you don't have that anymore. So, you know, so the next thing you're going to need to is to show them is how are you going to pay the mortgage? Uh, hopefully your multifamily unit is generating enough cash flow whereby, um, you know, it, it demonstrates, um, you know, uh, reliable income and also it meets the debt to income ratio and what they call the DSCR debt service coverage ratio which is what the banks look for uh, to determine how much money to borrow you so it may affect you and they also want to know how long have you been an independent contractor if you only just recently become an independent contract that may they may that may not work uh, I'm not saying it won't work. Uh, it just depends. Um, they want to show a consistency. Um, and they usually will want your tax returns. So your tax returns, usually typically it's two to three years worth of tax returns uh, that they're going to want to see. So uh, if your tax returns demonstrate that, uh, you know, uh, you got re reliable income, then you should be okay. If it doesn't, because you've only been a, a W-2 employee for a short period, uh, sorry, uh, independent contractor for a short time, it may go against you uh, just because there's no proven track record uh, uh, of success as an uh, as a independent contractor. So it, it just, again, it depends on the lender, Tammy. You definitely want to go to some of these uh, local banks, uh, more so than the big box bank. Uh, I think with a local bank, you can speak to somebody you can explain your situation with them and hopefully, uh, you know, they can sort of give you some cues or give some ideas how you can address the potential issue, uh, whether it be in terms of documentation, whether in terms of uh, statements or, 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 or what. OK, now there are some loans uh, whereby the documentation requirements are very low. And uh, they tend to want to, if this is a multi multi-family, they tend to give you the loan based not on so much on you, but on the cash flow that the asset generates. So uh, if you're getting a commercial loan, they may look at the asset itself more so than you. 
Uh, so if your asset is generating good enough cash flow to be able to take on this new loan through the DSCR calculation, then you may be okay, Tammy. So again, it just depends on the lender that you're going to go through. Uh, but I definitely would recommend that you go to one of these uh, smaller local banks as opposed to this, these big box banks uh, whereby decisions are not made locally and uh, they don't have a lot of uh, wiggle room for you. Okay, so if you've got some questions, uh, again, put them in the chat box. I'm more than happy to answer them for you. Let's have a look. Next one, Marlon. How you doing, man? Uh, yes, we have to hook up, Mr. Marlon. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I know we, I spoke to you. You called me while I was watching the, the World Cup soccer, you know, soccer game. Uh, so I got caught up in that thing. I'm really into the soccer game. We have, it's a pretty good World Cup. Anyway, I digress. Uh, give me a call. Uh, yeah, send me an email, Marlon. Give us some dates where we can hook up and connect and uh, and so on. So, yeah, Marlon Investor, should I use my credibility kit when going to banking institutions? Certainly, yes. Uh, the credit, okay, so for those people who don't know what we're talking about, uh, a credibility kit is something as a document uh, that I recommend that we all should have, uh, which kind of tells your story. Who are you? Uh, what's your background? What's your experience? Uh, you know, what's your track record? Uh, essentially, to um, you know, to answer the basic questions of who are you, what do you do, uh, what makes you different from everybody else, and uh, why they should do business with you. You know, why should they do business uh, with you, and how you're going to pay them the money. So. Uh, it, it, you know, it talks about your team that you have. Um, it talks about the systems uh, that you have, the methodology, why you're doing this, who are you, and all those different things. That's within the credibility kit. Um, it's a document that I think if you're meeting someone for the first time, you definitely want to bring it with you. Uh, the story I, I, I uh, on how I developed that uh, when I first did mine, um, a few years back, uh, so go back to Tammy's T's uh, point. Uh, I had uh, left my job, um, you know, because my rental income equaled the salary I was making. So I became an independent contractor, a full time real estate investor. And, uh, and so I, I, you know, I wanted to start getting more into acquiring more properties. So I spoke to my brother who was into banking. Uh, cause that's his business. He said to me, Joe, look, let's put together a document uh, which tells your story and uh, and so on, which is, uh, you know, what I did. And I went to this bank and uh, I was looking for like a half a million dollar line of credit. So he says to me, well, if you want half a million, make sure you apply for a million uh, because whatever happens, the bank's probably going to, you know, you know, uh, lower the amount that you're asking for. So go high and negotiate the rest. So I asked for a million dollars. I put together this credibility kit, met with the bankers, uh, went through the whole thing. And um, lo and behold, uh, they approved the $1 million request. So uh, the point is, is that these credibility kits work uh, and it differentiates you from your competition. And it's something that most investors don't do. And therefore, if you do it, you stand out uh, in a positive way. So I recommend everyone should do it. And, uh, you know, I think there's, uh, I think we have a sample one in uh, on my website for sale. So if you want to uh, download, if you want to buy one, uh, you can go there. Uh, it's my website, uh, www.joasimo.com. And I think there's some, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, let's have a look. I think there's a, a sample uh you know uh what's it called uh credibility kit to to purchase uh from the website okay so hopefully that was good uh again good question um you know marlon and uh and so on so let's have a look uh let me just kind of get towards the end because it's getting closer to the end and just kind of give everybody an update where where we are where i am on what i'm doing uh these are great times as I said, I'm looking forward to the slowdown in the market, and uh, you know, I'm 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 really putting the systems in place to to purchase more properties. 
and uh, with the goal of trying to uh, hold on to these assets until the market comes back, which it will do uh, in a few years' time. Nobody knows uh, how long it's going to be. Um, but one thing we do know, uh, based on historical anyway, at least in the Washington, D.C. area, the market will come back. And, uh, and uh, you know, and so you may be able to get purchased properties in 2022, uh, maybe 2018, uh, 2019 prices uh, during this sort of uh, slowdown. So that's what I'm doing. I'm, uh, I'm trying to uh, help other people do this, people who are ready to take action, um, you know, and uh, and either the busy professionals or whatever it is. But uh, the idea is that a uh, small group of people I'll work with and uh, we'll just start pulling the trigger, make it happen. And I help them uh, in that regard as well. So that's some of the things which I'm sort of pulling together and hopefully they'll be ready very, very shortly, uh, including the relationship with different institutions and, uh, and, and so on. So that's what I'm up to. Uh, let's have a look. So refinancing a couple of properties, uh, towards that end and uh, you know kind of take it a little easy not getting stressed too much out and uh kind of enjoying life and uh you know without without, without all the hustle and bustle associated with uh with that got a few uh, christmas parties i'm going to the next couple of weeks and hopefully if all goes well i'll be doing another overseas travel uh, early in the next year and uh probably go to ghana uh, if not, maybe go to another African country. I'm not too sure which one. It could be Uganda. Uh, but we know. We'll see. Anyway, that's what I'm up to. Hope everyone's doing well. And I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. A Wealth Wednesday. And uh, so, again, don't forget, okay, let's start getting our financial house in order because there's going to be some good opportunities with this slowdown in the market. So uh, hope everyone has a good time. And I'll see you next Wednesday, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Take care. Have a good night. Bye for now.